Today we're going to take a look at electromagnetic induction. And that's basically when a magnetic field is moved relative to a wire or anything that a current can flow through and you move it relative to one another, you're going to see that a current is induced within the current coil or within the wire or anything like that. So this is another example of the way that the magnetic and electric fields can induce each other whenever there is relative motion between them. So we have a couple of examples over here but that you can carry out in the laboratory where you can actually observe electromagnetic induction. First of all, we have a coil and this has no current in it. So we didn't, you know, you can see clearly that this is not connected to any sort of battery or anything. So by right, there should be zero current in it because there is no battery or power supply. It's only connected to a microammeter and initially it should show zero amperes. And you take a permanent magnet, let's say you move it into the coil and out of it and maybe you try it at different speeds, maybe you put it in and stop and then see how the current moves. And you will see that whenever you are moving it relative to the coil, the current will actually fluctuate. The faster you move it, the higher the ampere will be when you are moving it. When you stop it, the current value is going to go back to zero amperes. Now, another example of this is over here. These are magnets, and you would probably see that between these two magnets, you would see a magnetic field that would look probably something like that, considering this as the North Pole and the South Pole you would see a magnetic field. Let's say that you decide to move this wire, which is also not connected to any sort of power supply, so the wire wouldn't have current in it, and you move it into and like so through the magnetic field and out of the magnetic field and through and out. You will see that in the same way as this one, a current will be shown in the microammeter. So in both cases, a current is induced with relative motion between the wire and the magnet. This is electromagnetic induction. So as I previously said, there are factors affecting the induced current or the electromotive force because you know you need an electromotive force in order to have a current. So they're the same thing. Uh, straight wires, well, the factors affecting it would be, first of all, how much is the magnetic flux density? How strong is the magnetic field? Secondly, how long is the length of the wire that is within the field? And also, how quickly you move the wire. The faster you move it, the higher the electromotive force would be. For a coil that we saw over here, this situation, the magnetic flux density B, again, matters how strong is the magnet. Another one is the cross-sectional area of the coil. Then we have the number of turns of the wire and the rate at which the coil turns in the field. So basically the speed in a way. A simple way of understanding this would be when wires cut through magnetic field lines, a current can be thought of to be induced. And when a magnetic field line links coils of wire, then a current can be thought of to be induced. So, you know, this is pretty easy to understand. When you put a wire and you th put it through a magnetic field, you it's going to cut across field lines. It's cutting across one here, it's cutting across one all the way here. Now, for coils, you can think of it in the sense that how many field lines are linking them together. And you see that this one is linking together a couple of coils right here. This one is linking every single coil in this turning thing all together. Uh, over here, you put it through it and it will link different parts of this entire coil. So, you know, the more field lines cut the wires or the more field lines link the coils of wire, uh, the higher the EMF or the current that would be induced. So for a coil of wire with n turns, um, the effect is n times greater than that of a single coil of wire. Each coil can be thought of to be a wire in and of itself. So when it comes to electromagnetic induction, we take a look at Fleming's left right hand rule. And so Previously, when we had the motor effect, we looked at Fleming's left hand rule. Now, for Fleming's left hand rule, you use the left hand and it would probably look something like this. That's your left hand. And you have this, your thumb is going to point to 
the force that is exerted on a wire. And this is going to be the field direction and this is going to be the conventional, conventional current. So basically, this was when you had a magnetic field and you took a wire and you basically let the current flow in the wire. So let's say the wire had a current that was flowing here in the conventional direction. This was the direction of the magnetic field. Then if you, you pointed it the right way, the force would be going into the screen on the wire. So that's, that's how the force is going to be. It's going to move downwards into the screen. And, you know, this happened in a way because if you drew out the different um, currents, fields and stuff, for instance, this current has a magnetic field cr created around it, right? This is kind of what it is. And you can determine the direction of this one as well. It would be something like this. And basically what happens is that in one direction, the field lines will actually add together with the magnetic field. This is in the same direction, so it's going to add together. In the other direction, it's going to cancel out. This is in the opposite direction, so they cancel out. So it's like there's a stronger field over here on one direction, on one side of the wire, which causes the wire to be pushed in into the other side in order to right that imbalance. That's the origin behind what happens in the motor effect. What happens in the electromagnetic effect is we have the Fleming's right hand rule. And what happens is that if you have a, a field that's in this direction, it's exactly the same in a way. The in index finger is going to point in the direction of the field. The middle finger is going to point in the direction of conventional current. And this thumb will point in the motion. So it's kind of the same thing. Now, what is different is that the current is the induced one and the motion is the one that triggers it. Let's say you had a wire with no current and you pushed it down into this magnetic field. What would happen is that the field lines are pointing this way, so that's where your index finger should point. And then the motion is going to be downward, so that's where your thumb should point. And you would get that the conventional current runs in this direction. So that's the direction of the induced current. But why is it so? This is the explanation. Basically, we're going to use the same um, example where we have the North Pole here, the South Pole here, and a, cur uh, a wire here, and we move it down. Moving the conductor is equal to giving an electron in the conductor velocity in that direction. This results in the force on the electron BEV. And this is exactly what the motor force was, right? In the motor effect that we checked on previously, we would see that the force on the one electron that moves through is going to be equal to BEV. B is the magnetic flux density, V is the velocity with which the electron is moved. What I'm saying is, there are electrons, let's say this is an example of an electron, in this wire. If you move it down there, the electron is essentially moving in this direction, when an electron moves, that's a current. So actually, this is a motor effect with which we use the Fleming's left-hand rule, right? So the current is actually, the conventional current is going to be in this direction because it is in the opposite direction to the motion of the electron. Remember that conventional current is positive to negative. So take out your Fleming's left-hand rule and the motion which is the current, is going to be upwards. So point your middle finger upwards, and then you have a, a magnetic field that's north to south. So you can put your index finger in that direction, and you would get your thumb pointing in this direction. So the force on this electron, due to its motion downwards, is going to be this. That's the force. Now, let's say that this wire was connected to a total circuit. If there's a force in, the in an electron, it's going to move that way. So the electron is going to start flowing in this direction. And because conventional current is opposite direction to the motion of the electron, the conventional current in that wire that is induced is going to be in this direction, which is exactly what we got using Fleming's right-hand rule. So that's how it is. The, it, the essential reason behind this is 
obvious. It's because of the way that when an electron or a current flows, magnetic field that looks something like this is induced around it. This interacts with the external magnetic field, which gives it a force in the direction of the lower field density. So that's where everything stems from. The finger stuff doesn't really mean anything. It's just a very useful way for us to remember how this is. This is also kind of a 3D thing. And so it's kind of hard for us to remember it in other ways, which is why we use all of the hand signal stuff. But it's just a very useful way that we can orient our hands that fits the direction of the forces and the motions and stuff. But in reality, only one thing can explain the whole entire phenomena of Fleming's right hand rule, Fleming's left hand rule, and all that, which is this. What happens here explains everything. So the other things that we learn with all the hand signals is just an extension of that in order to help us remember everything and be able to um, think of it quickly without having to draw this entire thing and think about it from the ground up. So yeah, as I said, the force BEV will allow the electron to flow through the conductor and a current is induced. An additional part here is if the moved conductor is not part of a complete circuit, then an electromotive force is induced rather than a whole current, which makes sense because the electrons would be moved to one side, but they ought to stop. So there'll be a, a surplus of electrons on one side, which creates a voltage, which creates electromotive force in a way. This electromotive force, when linked to an external circuit, would be the source of electrical energy, hence the term electromotive force rather than the voltage difference, because it can be a source of electrical energy, which is a definition of the electromotive force. Now, if the wire also was not a part of a full circuit, then the positive charge would end up over here. Um, because the electrons will be moving over here, so the electrons will be accumulating on this side. The absence of electrons would be a positive charge. Finally, let's take a look at magnetic flux and magnetic flux linkage, uh, which is kind of almost the same thing. Now, we know that B, which is magnetic flux density, is the force on a wire divided by the current of the wire divided by the length of the wire. And this is the number of field lines that pass through a region per unit area in a way because this is the length. So that is magnetic flux density and per unit area means basically how many field lines pass through it if you had this much area. So it's, that's, what, that's where the name density comes from. Now if we take a look at magnetic flux on the other hand, it's the total number of magnetic field lines passing through a region. So that's pretty pretty straightforward. Let's say this was two meters squared, and then we have two field lines going into it. Then the magnetic flux density would be two divided by two, which is one T. T for Tesla, one Tesla, which is the unit for magnetic flux density. However, for magnetic flux is the total number of magnetic field lines passing through a region. The total number of magnetic field lines passing through this region would be two. So the magnetic flux here is two and this would be Weber's, which is the unit for magnetic flux. So magnetic flux uh, phi is basically going to be the magnetic flux density times the area. So we could actually get this over here as well. If it was one Tesla, one Tesla times two meters squared would be two Weber's as well. Um, and remember again that B is the component of magnetic flux density perpendicular to the area, not at an angle. Now, if we were to have something like this where the magnetic flux is coming in not perpendicular but at an angle, then we would have to get the component of the magnetic flux um, perpendicular to this. So if we zoomed in, we could do this by simple trigonometry, and let's say the angle between this sort of perpendicular axis to the surface and the magnetic flux was theta. Then obviously the component here, this is what we're trying to find, is going to be, and let's say this one is B, right? That would be cosine theta would be, and this is x, okay, this is what we're trying to find. Cosine theta would be b over x. So x would be b cosine 
x uh, b cosine theta, that's the component of b into perpendicularly into the area. So if we're trying to find the magnetic flux, then we know that the component of the magnetic flux density into the area is b cosine theta times that by the area, we get b a cosine theta, which is what we see over here for anything that is at an angle. Finally, let's explain magnetic flux linkage. The definition of magnetic flux linkage is that it's the product of the magnetic flux and the number of turns n of a coil. So remember how we said that the number of turns n of a coil is directly proportional to the amount of current that is induced in an electromagnetic induction? Well, this is the kind of the same thing. So magnetic flux linkage is basically, we just have to get the magnetic flux and then we times it by the, the turns of a coil. If we have um, a wire and then we have a coil, let's say we have one, two, three, four. So we have four turns of a coil over here. I am going to try and make this a turn. Um, we say that if the magnetic flux for one wire was um, one Weber, then we would have to times that by four. That's the total amount of magnetic flux for this entire coil. I hope that makes sense. So the unit for magnetic flux or magnetic flux, flux linkage is the Weber. And one Weber is the flux that, that's not a flux, that's a flux, that passes through an area of one meter squared when the magnetic flux density is one Tesla. Actually, it's a very big value. Usually it will be um, a very small fraction of a Weber. When the magnetic flux density or the area or theta changed then an electromagnetic force is induced because that's going to change the whole amount of magnetic flux um, for a certain object so whenever magnetic flux changes and this is affected by the angle or the area or the magnetic flux density that's when an electromotive force is induced. So that's about it for an introduction to electromagnetic induction. Um, stay tuned for the future videos that I will post on things like Faraday's law, Lenz's law, etc. Thank you for watching.